we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the mobile game June's Journey. We've never been sponsored by a mobile game before, partially because I'm not the hugest gamer, but as you know, the topics we cover on this channel can be incredibly dark and can take a toll on the soul. And that's why I'm really happy to introduce the game that I've been playing called June's Journey. June's Journey is an exciting and aesthetically appealing hidden object mystery game. I love playing as June while she journeys to solve her sister's murder. The captivating Roaring Twenties themed game reveals periodic clues as I go through each hidden object level. Each clue helps me uncover June's many family secrets. After completing the levels, I always look forward to the unique characters who arrive at strategic moments to assist me in piecing together the mystery of what happened to June's sister. Every scene in each chapter tells a story that is beautifully narrated through clues that immerse me in the storyline, while also giving my mind a much-needed respite from the real world. Download June's Journey for free by clicking the link below in the description. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Thank you so much to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Malibu, California is referred to as home by only the upper echelon of America's elite. And while the fast cars and vast mansions that decorate the scenic coastal town often leads to a false sense of entitlement by those who inhabit the coveted zip code, Far more dangerous is the false sense of safety and security felt by outsiders who dare to trespass upon the hallowed grounds of Hollywood's high society. Four such outsiders to this deceptively beautiful locale were Matrice Richardson, 24, Elaine Park, 22, Tristan Baudet, 35, and Matthew Weaver Jr., 21. All happy young adults with promising futures cut short. In 2010, Matrice Richardson's body was found in Malibu's Dark Canyon, 10 months after she was negligently released from the Lost Hills Sheriff Station and disappeared. Then, Elaine Park went missing in the same Malibu region in January of 2017. In June of 2018, scientist Tristan Baudet was shot to death in front of his daughters while camping in the Malibu Creek campgrounds, just six minutes from where Elaine's car was found. And in August of 2018, Matthew Weaver Jr. disappeared from the same spot. This secluded and scenic area known as Dark Canyon was turning out to be aptly named indeed. And while a nine-year span separates these four mysterious tragedies, until this tangled web is made clear by LA's supposed finest, a cloud of confusion and cover-up will continue to linger over the families and friends of those lost. The region these four individuals were lost or killed in is a popular hiking trail and driving loop, which doubles as a smoke spot for local teens and moonlights as a lover's lane. This scenic canyon in LA County is located in the ritzy hills of Malibu, and while it's only eight minutes from the freeway, as its namesake would indicate, the inky blackness of the hillsides of Dark Canyon are every bit as obscure and impenetrable as the law enforcement agencies tasked with protecting them. Because, as everyone in showbiz will tell you, the brighter a light shines, the darker a shadow it casts. The first young life tragically cut short in Dark Canyon was Matrice Richardson. Graduating from California State University Fullerton with a BA in Psychology in 2008, Matrice Richardson had her entire life ahead of her with which to learn to balance her obvious intelligence with what can be a highly intrusive and difficult to treat mental illness, that of bipolar disorder. 
the manifestations of which can be deceptively unpredictable and sporadic in nature. Residing in L.A., Matrice deviated from her usual leisure activities when she went, alone, to a swanky upscale restaurant in Malibu and ordered a steak. Although she sat alone, she made attempts to talk with a nearby party, eventually joining their table, albeit somewhat to the attendees' surprise. But her colorful and upbeat attitude mollified the other party members, and they chatted away with Matrice. However, they soon departed in the same fashion in which they arrived, without Matrice in tow. After attempting to leave the restaurant herself without paying the $89 bill, claiming the party she had joined said they would pay for it, the 21-year-old's disturbed mental state caught the eye of staff. As Matrice's voice carried over the cacophony of the surrounding conversations and cutlery, Staff noticed that she was attempting to explain that things were actually, quote, subliminal. And witnesses recall that Matrice intonated that she was from Mars with the purpose of avenging Michael Jackson's recent death. Suffering from the sometimes catastrophic effects of bipolar disorder, Matrice was not normally this erratic in her behavior. Her incoherent and excitable rambling eventually led to an altercation with the called-upon police, resulting in her detainment. She was arrested and taken into custody for possessing less than an ounce of marijuana and failing to pay her bill. To begin the young woman's nightmarish experience, the responding officers separated Matrice from her phone, her purse, and her wallet as they were all in her vehicle, which was towed to an impound lot located on the Pacific Coast Highway, more than 10 miles from where she was locked in a holding cell of the Lost Hill Sheriff's Department while they called her emergency contact, her mother. When Matrice's mother spoke to the responsible officers, a conversation made over a recorded department line, she stated clearly her concern for her obviously unwell daughter's well-being and offered to pick her daughter up if they were planning on releasing her that night as she didn't want her vulnerable and mentally unwell daughter free to walk about in an unknown location in the dead of night. On that recorded phone call, her mom says, quote, It's dark, she doesn't have a car, and I don't want her wandering. When she is assured by the communicating officer that Matrice would in fact be held until morning, her mother again double-checks that fact and goes on to make what would later turn out to be an ominously clairvoyant statement. Intending to express her uncertainty and fear in regards to her child's safety, Matrice's mother one more time asks the first responder if she should come get her daughter now or if it could wait until the morning, adding, quote, I would hate to wake up to a morning report. Girl lost somewhere and her head chopped off. Specifically responding to this morbid and unfortunately prophetic statement, the deputy on the other line assured Matrice's mother multiple times that she could wait until morning to come get her 21-year-old daughter. Unfortunately, contrary to what was explicitly told to Matrice's mother, the exact opposite happened, and the college graduate and beauty queen a woman who was struggling with mental illness, but who, by all accounts, had a promising life ahead of her which was yet to even fully begin, was suddenly and inexplicably released into the night at 12.28 a.m. Left to her own accord on the side of a dark road, with no phone, money, or any ability to get help, her car locked in a tow yard ten miles away, Matrice wandered. At around 6.30 a.m., just as the sun was beginning to crest over Malibu's million-dollar homes, Matrice seemingly sought refuge in the backyard of Bill Smith, a well-known local news anchor for KTLA. When Smith opened his window to inquire if he could help the young woman, Matrice reportedly told him that she was simply, quote, resting. The police were called. However, Matrice had already vacated the premises and was nowhere to be found. Although the police made a somewhat half-hearted attempt at searching for the young woman, they said she was already gone, lost to the impenetrable darkness of the canyon, and therefore out of their jurisdiction. Upon further media questioning and police canvassing for the then still missing 21-year-old, a Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department spokesperson defended the choice to release Matrice with no support or additional resources because, as he said, quote, 
She exhibited no signs of mental illness or intoxication. She was fine. She's an adult. This would be a statement in direct opposition to witness accounts from the night of the incident when Matrice was recalled by restaurant goers as manically disconnected, rambling about celebrity conspiracies, a clear indication to even a layperson that the young woman was at least temporarily mentally unwell. The department defended their actions, stating that Matrice had been invited to wait in the lobby, but had declined. However, this is again in direct opposition to what the officer had told Matrice's mother on the recorded line, when she called to inquire if she should come pick up her mentally unwell daughter in the middle of the night, or if they would be releasing her in the morning. The department could give no logical reasoning for their mistakes. Matrice Richardson's body was finally found 11 months after being negligently released into the night with no money, phone, or means of help. Her partially mummified remains were discovered by park rangers only one and a half miles from the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. Found near the creek bed in Dark Canyon, she was without her clothing near a suspected gang-organized illegal cannabis grow. Matrice's family and critics of the department's handling of this case find it highly suspicious that the investigators were so eager to rule her death as anything but that of a homicide. Some members of the force said that Matrice may have died of anaphylactic shock originating from acute exposure to poison oak, something which the media was quick to point out is not a statistical likelihood. Another theory purported by police is that Matrice wandered into Dark Canyon and died of venom poisoning from multiple rattlesnake bites, in what would be another statistical anomaly. More suspicious than their inability to come up with the cause of death is their absence of a reason for Matrice's lack of clothing. While investigators attempted to justify her nakedness as being that of a victim of scavenging animals, the media pointed out that her belt buckle had to have been unlocked and slipped out of the belt loops of her jeans, which is not exactly something animals are apt to do. Additionally, her socks and shoes were taken off and her underwear removed separately from the removal of her jeans, which seemed to also have been purposefully removed as opposed to chewed off by animals. Additionally, her bra, which had the classic two-hook clasp in the back, had been undone, not chewed away, but physically unfastened. The jeans, the belt, and the bra were all recovered, but further testing has not been released to the media. In 2011, in hopes of seeing some form of consequence for the irresponsible actions of the Sheriff's Department, the Richardson family privately settled a lawsuit with LA County for $900,000. However, no paltry sum of money can make up for life lost. The family remains hopeful that new answers will come in the form of new evidence or newly brought forth witnesses. Another life tragically lost to the obscurity of Dark Canyon was Tristan Baudet. While taking the burden off his wife, who was attending to her academic needs of her final stages as a medical student, 35-year-old Tristan Baudet, a scientist from Irvine, took his two- and four-year-old daughters on a daddy-daughter camping trip. His brother was going to be moving out of the area soon, so they also used it as a chance to have one last hurrah. But nobody knew that it would end with such tragic finality because what should have been a joyous and memorable experience soon turned to disaster when, in the pre-dawn hours of what should have been a beautiful day, at 4.44 a.m., Tristan, who was sleeping shortly after a much-needed, long-awaited, and ominously fitting goodbye with his brother, was shot right through his tent directly in his head. His two girls, blood-soaked and terrified, were physically unharmed, although experts agree the psychological damage sustained is incalculable. The campground that they had reserved, highly rated and lauded by locals and tourists alike, the Malibu Creek State Park Campground, has since been closed. Police have not released any information about any potential motive, but there have been reports as far back as 2016 of gunshots in the area with a biologist camping at the same campground in November having awoken to a pain in his arm, which the hospital first attributed to an injury made by a rodent and administered a rabies shot, but which he later found bullet shards in and realized he had been shot at while he was sleeping. 
Additionally, other campers had previously reported being shot at as well, although there were no casualties. A Tesla was also shot at and had a window broken in the same area. The juxtaposition of it all was almost unfathomable. In 2019, Anthony Rauda, a parolee with a history of charges regarding local robberies, was arrested in October after being found supposedly with a gun in the Malibu Hills near the sheriff's station. Many close to the case, including unnamed sources directly on the force, are suspicious of the arrest and postulate the possibility of him being merely a scapegoat for the killing of the young father as they question why someone who was one of Malibu's most wanted would have continued to loiter in such close proximity to a law enforcement agency. No updates have been given about the status of his arraignment. Much to the frustration of family and locals alike, there have been no further updates in this murder, and it remains unsolved. Matthew Weaver was a 21-year-old living in Simi Valley, California. In 2018, he moved out of his stepmother's house in Simi Valley and into his own apartment in the Granada Hills. He moved in order to be closer to his new job, where he worked as a lineman for a telephone pole construction company. His father also worked at the same company. He had recently broken up with his girlfriend, but his family said he was already starting to move on and had recently made some new friends. On August 9th, Matthew picked up his check from the company and told his father that he was going to go hang out with a new female friend. Matthew then picked up the friend, Melissa Sanchez, from her house and both partied late into the night. Matthew dropped Melissa off at her home around 4.30 a.m. that morning. Ten minutes later, his phone records placed Matthew on Maholland Highway, heading towards the Malibu Canyons near Rose's Overlook. Between 5.45 and 6.24 a.m., he drove around Saddle Peak Road and Shurin Road. At around 6.30 a.m., he stopped at the parking lot at Stunt Road and Saddle Peak Road in Topanga Canyon and posted a Snapchat video of the view. Near the parking lot, there was a metal gate that blocked Topanga Tower Motorway, a dirt road which was usually closed to the general public. At 7.13 a.m., a CCTV camera captured his car driving on the Topanga Tower motorway towards Rose's Overlook. Around 7.30 a.m., it is believed Matthew reached the end of the trail in the area of Rose's Overlook. Then, three hours later, he called his friend Melissa, but as she was at work, she didn't answer the phone. She did, however, text him back to say that she was at work and asked, quote, what's up? Matthew replied in jumbled texted words, saying, quote, like some crazy is going on, shit going on, and, quote, I just to talk while I have the chance. This would be the last time anyone heard from Matthew. His phone either ran out of battery or it was turned off after this conversation. Melissa replied an hour later, asking if he was okay, but Matthew never responded. Later, around 12 a.m., an individual called 911 after hearing what they believed to be a male and female voice crying out for help coming out of the area of Rose's Overlook. Police arrived at the scene and searched the road. They found Matthew's BMW in the area of Rose's Overlook above the Backbone Trail in Hondo Canyon. An immediate search of the area was launched. The next few days, the police searched the area thoroughly using cadaver dogs, helicopters, and volunteers, but nothing would turn up. After these initial searches, the police stopped taking interest in the case. Feeling as if the police were not taking the case seriously, family and friends of Matthew Weaver organized their own searches. And in addition to and independent from the efforts, or lack thereof, of the LAPD, in January of 2019, with the help of a land surveying company, Matthew's family took some aerial photos and videos. Using a drone, they captured footage of the area where Matthew had disappeared. They released these photos and asked the public for any help in the search. Soon, with the help of strangers, family found Matthew's hat a t-shirt with a rip on it, which seemingly contained a smear of what appeared to be blood, and his car keys, which have been confirmed as belonging to Matthew. The evidence was given to the search and rescue department at Malibu Lost Hill Station, and it remained in an evidence locker at the station for approximately three months. 
Repeated pleas by the family for the LAPD to come pick up the valuable evidence for testing was ignored. Finally, after the media got involved on the Weaver's behalf, the evidence was transferred to the LAPD, and the t-shirt containing blood was tested for Weaver Jr.'s DNA. But police relayed the disappointing and confusing information that multiple attempts at coding the DNA led to quote, inconclusive results. The family is still hoping to get the entire incident report from the night Matthew went missing, but are being told by the LA Sheriff's Department and the CHP that they have no report from that night besides the initial 911 call. There have been no further updates in the case and it remains unsolved. Born on September 24, 1996, Elaine Park was 20 years old when she went missing. A lover of musical theater and an involved member of multiple dance companies, she was also an aspiring actress. She is credited as being an extra on popular television shows such as ER, Mad TV, Desperate Housewives, Crazy Stupid Love, and Role Models. She previously attended Pierce College in Los Angeles, but dropped out to work full-time. An amateur rapper, Elaine also wrote spoken word poetry about her own life. Elaine's friends and her brother recall that she had a childhood lacking the unconditional love typically given to children. Her mother and father had gotten a divorce as an adolescent, and though they still had children under 18, Elaine's father introduced the idea of and offered to sign a document that would revoke his parental rights and sever all ties with his children. Though that document never came into fruition, Elaine's father was not a major part of her life. Elaine lived with her mother and was financially dependent on her. However, their relationship was reportedly not close. As neighbors recall, they heard fighting often late into the night. According to all witnesses and digital artifacts, Elaine Park was last seen alive during the early hours of January 28, 2017. Of Korean descent, she had brown hair and wide brown eyes that were usually meticulously lined with eyeliner. She was 5'6 and roughly 125 pounds, and was last seen wearing a white sweatshirt, or possibly a hoodie, and denim shorts, or possibly gray sweatpants. Those close to her recall that she often wore a necklace which had an E on it. On Thursday, January 26th, 2017, Roughly two days prior to her going missing at around 3.30 a.m., Elaine texted her mom a pin of her car's location. She was stranded on a bridge, her car having run out of gas, and while she was waiting for help, her car battery had died as well. Her mother, along with her boyfriend Jeff, drove out to assist Elaine in jumping her car and getting her gas. Jeff and Susan, Elaine's mother, claim that after they successfully got Elaine back home, she passed out on the couch. Her mom claims that Elaine was very skimpily dressed in a lingerie type of getup. Elaine's mother claims that when she and Jeff walked into the living room, Elaine shrieked in surprise and ran to her bedroom. Elaine's mom says that this was the last time she ever physically saw Elaine. Susan then says that she and her boyfriend Jeff left the house, and when they returned, they recalled that Elaine was still in her room, though they do not recall seeing or speaking with her. This is the last time her mom and Jeff say they ever physically knew Elaine to be in the home. This was one day prior to Elaine's last text communication with Susan, as backed up by Verizon's phone records. On Friday, January 27, 2017, the last day of communication between Elaine and Susan entailed Susan texting Elaine $20 using the quick pay feature of Apple and Elaine texting back that she'll return her mother the money by 6 p.m. that night. When she still hadn't received the $20 by 7 o'clock that evening, her mom texted Elaine to ask why she hadn't paid her back the money. Elaine, in what would be her last text communication between her and her mother digitally that investigators know of, replies to her mother's text from two hours prior, stating, give me until later tonight. On January 27th, Elaine went to the movies with her on-again-off-again boyfriend, Divine Compare, known by his friends as Div. 
The film was called The Return of Xander Cage and was playing at the AMC Promenade at 10.45 p.m. The pair Ubered there and back, returning to Div's affluent family's property at around 1 a.m. in the early mornings of January 28th. This is confirmed via surveillance footage from the outside of their home. Less than five hours after arriving home from the movies, her boyfriend recalls that, for unknown reasons, Elaine woke up in a panic, visibly shaking. She then hastily left. Elaine exits her boyfriend's guest house at around 6.01 a.m., but the video is cut off at 6.05 a.m., just prior to Elaine actually getting into her car. However, a license plate reader on the Compare property verifies that Elaine's Honda Civic did in fact exit the gated community a few minutes later. Some critics point out that it was never clear who was actually driving the car when it exited the Compare property, as the only artifact for that is the license plate reader recording, and not the actual CCTV footage, due to an unfortunate twist of digital fate. The reason investigators do not have the critical footage of Elaine leaving is because, before the CCTV could tell police what happened next, the footage cut out. An error, police claim, which occurred when they attempted to transfer the footage over from the camera's unit to one of their police storage devices. An act so commonplace and so frequently done by police that some have said it is almost beyond the scope of possibilities how such a highly funded department could be this untrained. The footage is lost forever as it was permanently erased. At 6.28 a.m., Elaine's location was shared to Divine through iMessage. It is unclear if Elaine sent this herself or if it was automatically sent by her phone. At 7.13 a.m., the Pandora music app on her phone was used. At 9.28 a.m., she received a notification from the Pandora app, which asked, quote, Are you still listening? Suggesting that Elaine likely disappeared between 7.13 a.m. and 9.28 a.m. Between 10.13 and 10.15 a.m., Divine called Elaine two times, but she did not pick up. At 10.41 a.m. on that day, Saturday the 27th, Susan texts Elaine what she says was a reminder all records have been deleted, so there's no proof as to what exactly was in the text messages. Susan said that because she didn't receive a response, she called Elaine's phone and says that the phone went to voicemail after two rings. Susan then texts Elaine again, although records are lost as to what the text messages specifically contained. However, Susan says she was texting again about the $20. With no response, Susan said she checked Elaine's room and that she noticed Elaine's normal overnight bag was gone and that her makeup was also gone. Susan then said that she emailed and tried to contact her via Facebook to no avail. At 3.42 p.m. that same day, her phone pinged for the last time from Malibu, California. Div made a Twitter post on January 29th, one day after Elaine left his home in a panic, which was a retweet of someone else's posting, which said, quote, If a girl leaves some SHIT at my crib, it's getting thrown out immediately. The next day, Sunday, January 29th, Susan decides she wants to file a missing persons report because she says Elaine would have paid her back the $20, and the fact that she hasn't has worried her. In another interview, Susan mentions that Elaine would often leave for nights on end without contact. On February 1st, after filing a missing persons report, Susan supposedly wrote the following message on the whiteboard on Elaine's room door. Elaine, as soon as you decide to come home and you are home, please let me know at your earliest. I am so worried. I do love you, Mom. This was dated February 1st, 2017. 
In regards to Susan's whereabouts on Friday night and into Saturday morning, Susan's timeline and alibi are varied. Susan Park, in an interview, says, quote, She didn't come home that night. I was... I remember. I stayed home that night. She didn't come home the next morning. Oh, wait, was I home? I don't remember. She first claimed she wasn't home, but later said the following in regards to the aftermath of Elaine's car running out of gas and her and Jeff having to rescue her prior to her going missing. So because that incident, Friday night, Saturday night, middle of the night, I came home. I even told Jeff, I said, you know, I'm worried because she's having car problems. I need to go home. I think I did that consecutively, maybe like 2.30 or 2 o'clock or something, or 3 o'clock sometime. As I remember, there was no trace of Elaine. There was no trace. On February 2nd, five days after Elaine was last seen on her boyfriend's home security footage, her car was found, seemingly parked and abandoned, although whether by choice or by force, it is unknown. Elaine's 2015 charcoal gray Honda Civic was found at Corral Beach in Malibu, parked on the shoulder of the 26,000 block of the Pacific Coast Highway. The car's doors were unlocked, and the keys were still in the ignition, turned into the on position. The car's battery was dead. Elaine's phone was in the center console, her backpack on the seat, her laptop tucked safely inside, along with $30. But while all of the material items that a young person would treasure were found in the car, there was still no sign of Elaine. With no note, no indication of a struggle, and no indication of a robbery, law enforcement bizarrely suggested that this could have been a case of suicide, where Elaine simply parked her car and then wandered into the ocean to end her life. No evidence via social media posts, text messages recovered, or eyewitness statements suggests that Elaine was suicidal. And while she, like most 20-year-olds, had her fair share of personal, familial, and relationship issues, by all indications, Elaine's focus was on self-care and positivity. In a seemingly continuous pattern of mistakes and procedural graphs of disastrous proportions by various Southern California law enforcement agencies, including the Glendale Police Department, as well as the Malibu Lost Hill Sheriff Station and Malibu Search and Rescue, there was absolutely no collection or testing of any of Elaine's mysteriously and abruptly abandoned personal items. With nothing being taken into custody for evidence processing, all of Elaine's belongings were given back to her family. Her mom has reiterated that she washed and put away all of her daughter's belongings, so no further forensic analysis is possible. Such a decision by police to not collect artifacts in the case brought back memories for locals of previous instances of investigatory mishap, and many expressed frustration towards the law enforcement agencies tasked with protecting the area. Critics of the investigation questioned why police were not doing more about the fact that young people were going missing from this area in far greater proportion in recent years. A sentiment presumably echoed by the parents of Matthew Weaver and Matrice Richardson as well, who fought tirelessly to get investigators to take the cases of their children's fate more seriously. It was no secret that the mother-daughter relationship was not close. Neighbors recall that they often heard fighting between the two, often late into the night. Elaine's friend Daisy, with whom she lived for a period, says of the relationship between Elaine and her mother, quote, They just didn't, I feel, like, care enough, which is sad. Her mom would kick her out a lot. Elaine didn't have keys sometimes because her mom would lock her out, literally change the locks. Her mom would blame her because her dad and her separated. Sadie, a close friend of Elaine, said Elaine's mother was reportedly very controlling and withholding to Elaine in regards to money in general, both in respect to the money that Elaine earned as an extra in film and television and in regards to a certain impending insurance payout, a main point of contention in their relationship, as evidenced in their recovered text messages. Although Elaine's phone would theoretically contain all of the messages sent between her and her mother in the days and hours leading up to her disappearance, her mother claims she accidentally activated the auto-delete function of the phone when she received it back from police, 
after no forensics were taken, by repeatedly entering the wrong password, an act that some now question was intentionally malicious, as despite being told by P.I. Jaden Brandt to stop entering random guesses before the phone deleted everything, she continued to do so. In 2016, Elaine and her friend Sadie, who was the driver, had gotten into a car accident. Elaine heroically pulled at the car window's broken glass with her bare hands in order to get the trapped occupants of the other party's car. While her hands were bloodied and cut from this act of good Samaritanship, her body nor her back was actually injured, which is in direct opposition to what she told the insurance company in the ensuing days. Sadie theorizes that it was Elaine's mother who encouraged her to file this claim. Prior to the accident, Elaine loved attending hip-hop concerts, and her injuries did not prevent her from attending the myriad of shows in the ensuing months after the accident. In regards to the impending insurance payout, Elaine emailed her mother in June of 2016, quote, I already know you want the checks for my routing info for the insurance check. Once it arrives, it better be either linked directly to my checking account, or if it's a physical check, directly in my hands. The full amount. I'm going to call the office and make sure you're not pulling any snake SHIT either. In July of 2016, one month after this initial email, after an argument between her and her daughter in regards to Elaine going out to eat before seeing the chiropractor who would help bolster the insurance claim's validity, Elaine's mom texted her daughter the word die eight times. Die, 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 die. die. When asked about Elaine's borrowing of money to feed and transport herself, Susan admits that she did require Elaine to pay her back on a strict and unforgiving schedule through a cash app on their phones. At her mother's meticulous attempt at collecting on the debts, Elaine's friend Sadie recalls that Elaine often had to ask her mother for money, and her mother reportedly hounded her to repay on time, even the smallest amount. Elaine told Sadie that her mother had taken roughly $8,000 which she had earned of her own accord from working as an extra on film sets, and Elaine was worried that her mom might take the future insurance settlement as well. Everything was about money, Sadie recalls, and Elaine was never made to feel like a daughter, but more like a burden. Elaine's mother claimed that her daughter had a bad habit of spending money, and that she wanted to control and discipline her spending habits. Elaine's mother recalls an instance where Elaine once had $800 in her possession and spent it all in one day. Other red flags appear besides the lack of clarity surrounding the timeline and alibi of Susan, including the fact that she cleaned Elaine's room in the days after her disappearance and washed all potential evidence received back from police. Susan also disabled and deleted Elaine's iPhone by trying the password F-U-C-K as the last attempt. And she did not tell the neighbors that Elaine was missing, nor did she put up any flyers in their neighborhood. Susan admits she never passed out flyers in her own neighborhood because she claimed she wanted the focus of the investigation to be on the Calabasas area. But she also admits that the situation was, quote, embarrassing because the neighbors had been privy to her and Elaine's loud arguments, being that their volume was so great it could be heard from neighboring yards. Susan also gave Elaine's two cats, Coco and Bandit, up for adoption mere months after her disappearance. On May 6, 2017, two cadaver dogs searched the home of Elaine and Susan Park. And while this was six months after Elaine's disappearance, the specialized nature of such animals makes this time passage less important. In fact, the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory found that dogs could detect the telltale chemicals of death even hundreds of years later. The first cadaver dog showed what is called focused interest in Elaine's bedroom. From the report itself, written by the handler of the two cadaver dogs, he says, quote, Upon smelling the outside of the bedroom door, the first dog smelled, sat, and looked at me, indicating an alert of an odor in which he has previously been trained. He also alerted on the floor molding in the hallway immediately near this door, in a small closet with cleaning supplies in the hallway, 
hand in the clothes closet. Opening the closet door, he continued to show this focused interest in the contents, especially the suitcase and other items just inside the closet door. The only area of additional interest was a covered storage shed. The first dog showed interest inside the shed area, but did not localize to a single spot within it. Incidentally, on March 31st of 2017, two months after Elaine's disappearance, Susan made a new entry in her iPhone calendar, reminding her that at 9 a.m. she should, quote, hide it. This was the morning of the first time that members of the investigatory team would visit Elaine's room, a visit that was scheduled that day for 10.30 a.m., just one and a half hours after the first alert to hide it was made. That same day, after all the investigators on the team were scheduled to leave, Susan had an entry at 1.30 p.m. alerting her to, quote, put back hide items dash shed. Elaine's mother claims this was regarding some green stuff that she found in Elaine's room and that she did not want the decisions or opinions of the police to be affected. Even though to many, Susan's actions and behavior towards Elaine seem suspicious, there is no evidence to prove her involvement. She has so far been working tirelessly to find her daughter. Initially, while much of the focus was on Elaine's affluent boyfriend, Div, as their relationship had been through its highs and lows, there is nothing which indicates that he ever had any contact with Elaine, digital or otherwise, after that hurried exit which she made in the early morning hours of January 28th. The Compare family have been helpful and forthcoming with investigators in the aftermath of Elaine's disappearance. Elaine, before making up with Divine, was reportedly seeing another man who was described as clingy and aggressive. In one incident in 2016, this man and Elaine were pulled over by the police. And while searching his car, police found an unauthorized firearm in his possession. Elaine was set to testify against the man in a court hearing just two days after she disappeared. Many theorized that he may have killed Elaine to prevent her from testifying. However, the man has been extensively questioned by police, and so far, no evidence suggests that he had anything to do with her disappearance. Elaine has a pierced nose and pierced ears, along with several distinctive tattoos, including a dagger and flowers on her right arm, a rose on her left shoulder, and a cow skull and a moth on her left arm. New information uncovered by investigators lead the public to believe that the death of Tristan Baudet was seemingly unrelated to the other three deaths. Anthony Rhoda, 46, who some dubbed as the Malibu Sniper, was recently found guilty for the killing of Tristan Baudet, shot inside a tent while camping with his two young children. Prosecutors were seeking a first-degree murder conviction. However, jurors convicted him instead of the lesser charge of second-degree murder. Anthony Rhoda was also convicted of three counts of attempted murder and five counts of second-degree commercial burglary for similar crimes in the area. The jury acquitted him of seven other attempted murder charges. Tristan's family mourn his senseless loss and continue to hold out hope that more information will come out as to the motivations behind such a heinous act. <laughs>